Welcome to episode seven of the Ad Quick Advertising Podcast with your hosts, Chris Gaddick and Adam Singer. Today's guest, I'm really excited about one of the OG B2B uh, tech marketers who specializes in content. We have Ross Simmons, uh, CEO and founder of Foundation Marketing and uh, confidant to some of the fastest growing B2B companies in tech. Um, how y'all doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to chatting with you guys today. It's going to be fun. Adam, I am good. Chris. You go back. Do you go back? You go back with, uh, you know, everybody. So you go back with Ross back in the day, right? Yeah. Ross is OG internet marketer, social media marketer, content marketer. Um, literally everyone in the industry knows him. He's one of the nicest people online. Um, <laughs> Actually, one of my questions is going to be a, around like optimism and like how it. through all the chaos, it's like every day it's Ross is just in a good mood. Like I want to be the Mister Rogers of this space. Like I'm just trying the to sweater bring games on point. I try. That's true. It's <laughs> but like no, I want to like I want to borrow a cup of Ross's <laughs> just positive energy some days because he is just always after it, and it's like Appreciate he just it. warms my heart. Appreciate it. I think it's the Canadian too, right? Like there's a there's a there's this sentiment of Canadians always trying to be too nice. And I just lean fully into my stereotype and I'm just like, yeah, I'm the nice Canadian. That's uh, that's what I got to be. So um, I appreciate the kind words, but yeah, me and Adam go way back to the early days of like Facebook just starting and like Jetman being a thing. Like back in the day, there wasn't TikToks and like reels and all of this stuff. And now we're in a whole different world, um, but it's fun. It's been fun to watch the internet evolve and it continues to do so, but super excited to chat with you guys. This is going to be fun. Cool. So let, let's start there. I think that's a good starting point. So, you know, you mentioned that there's, uh, we come from a world where there's no TikTok, no reels. And right. to me, it, it, to me, it seems like a lot of marketers are kind of missing the big picture and telling the entire mm -hmm. story, whether it, using the, their, the channels at their dis disposal and like, they're only thinking about maybe, you know, one piece of the funnel. Um, yeah. And how do you, what are you seeing right now, Ross, in terms of your clientele? And like, how are people starting to get out of this world where we're only focused on like last click attribution and yeah. performance to telling that broader message, that broader story using a variety of channels? It's interesting. Like, I kind of feel like I'm in a, in a movie because it's like groundhog day over and over again. Like I've been in the industry for long enough where it's like, I see these cycles and the cycles continue over and over and over again. And people who are new get caught in the hype, but like we forget the first principles and fundamentals of marketing very, very quickly in the space. When you start to see a new tool pop up, like clubhouse and it launches and everybody goes wild. Everybody's like buzzing over it. That's the same experience that happened with Foursquare right? Like it's the same thing. And some people are like, what's Foursquare? Because like, those are some of the OG tools that at the moment in the time when they were announced and they were like taking over the internet, everyone thought that that was the future. Everyone thought, oh, this is the thing. But like in reality, attention moves in waves and the channels in which we consume content on the stories, they oftentimes change. There's going to be one or two that ultimately become sticky. But once that stickiness is there, it's like, okay, now you can just go all in. You know that your audience is here. You know your audience is spending time there. Let's embrace fundamentals. Let's recognize that humans are, have chemically been the same ever since the beginning. And we all just like get stirred up with the same type of emotions and chemical things that stir up the right reactions. And if you can connect with people emotionally, if you can connect with them logically in a, a more transactional way, if you're talking B2B, like there are simple fundamentals that just, that just last and simple storytelling that just lasts. And it doesn't really matter too much when you get down to it to say like, what are the most successful brands doing today versus 15 years ago? It's all the same. It's storytelling. The channels change, the message might change slightly, but it's like storytelling, recognizing that there's an opportunity to tell a story in a different way on a channel where you have product user fit, like the content user fit, so to speak. But that's really it. Like doubling down on that is the game. Um, and I think oftentimes we get caught up in the, the latest trend instead of realizing like it's a lot of just the, the basic principles of marketing that need to be embraced. I love the cool. you know comment about, you know, timeless storytelling. Mm. Um, I wanted to build on that. Sorry, Chris, you can, you can ask your next question next. No, no, please, um, please go for it. Related to that one, there, there's the, you know, the trope for good reason that yeah. B2B is boring, right? right, and, right. and you and I don't think that's the case. I think right. obviously nope. it's super interesting, but like, why is that a trope? And 
are the marketers who are still doing boring B2B hopeless. And yeah. I guess for the marketers listening that are in B2B and are like, well, maybe what I'm doing is a little bit dry. Like what are some actionable ways that they yeah. could help us make B2B not boring? Yeah, I think it comes down to storytelling, right? Like a lot of B2B marketers think it's boring because they don't actually think in stories. They think exclusively around product features. Let's sell that. Let's sell that over and over again. Instead of thinking about what are the problems of my audience that might not even have a direct influence on what I'm offering. So like oftentimes you're selling a software and all you want to do is create content on that software. Let's take the most boring example, waste management, right? Like if you're in the world of waste management, it becomes kind of risky to say, okay, I'm going to create content about something outside of a waste management solution or the process to like manage the waste waste management fleet or something like that. Like it's very difficult for most marketers in these companies to think outside of their direct world. But if you put yourself in the shoes of your actual customer, you realize that they're a human and humans have a lot of things that motivate them and things that inspire them. And when you start to think about it that way, you might realize, oh, someone who works at a waste management company might work in government if it's somewhere it, like in a, a place where that system is ran by the government, or they might be in a private company. And those motivations of those two individuals might be very different. For some, it might be trying to figure out how to um, balance their life. And maybe you want to create content on that for government employees, or maybe it's in the private sector and you might be talking about how to elevate your career and how to get a promotion and how to communicate with your team and how to lead people more softer things that at first glance have nothing to do with waste management. But if you position it well, and the topic is around how to elevate your career in the world of waste management, there's only one person that's ever going to click on that piece of content. It's going to be someone in the world of waste management. And to them, their career is anything but boring. Their career is a part of their livelihood. So when they start to consume that content, they're going to start to think, oh, wow, this brand is helping me elevate my career. They're helping me elevate um, my life. They're allowing me to put food on the table. This is a great thing. But you're telling stories throughout it. You're not just saying, oh, you want to do this, you want to do that. You can start to inject stories of past customers, past clients. You distribute that story to your past clients and allow them to even be interviewed to a point where, oh, now our clients are going to start sharing this internally. What does that result in? Oh, it results in a bigger, stronger brand connection between your brand and that entire organization. And that's where magic starts to happen in B2B. The reason why it's constantly considered to be boring is because of two key factors. One, organizations create borders and boundaries for, for their creators, their marketers, their teams that say, we have to stay within this box. And that holds them back from being able to think outside of it. And then two, legacy marketers who come from that past environment and an environment where those kind of restrictions were in place, take their same constraints and bring them to new companies. And then we stay in a cycle of let's do boring things over and over again because we did boring things at our old company and we didn't get fired. So let's keep doing boring things over and over again. And that is why I think so many B2B organizations are stuck in this world of creating boring content and telling boring stories that oftentimes people don't actually care about. That was an awesome answer. Um, and, and then, so I guess before I ask the next question, can you tell us a little bit about Foundation Marketing and, yeah. and the company and your clients and, and your operation? For sure. So Foundation started off with just myself. I was a marketing guy. I went to, to university, started a marketing blog, had the marketing blog, started to get traction from companies all over the globe. People started to reach out to get me to speak at their events and things of that nature. And I started to work with them, um, started to get some great traction and great results. And I was like, okay, let's scale this thing a little bit further and start to build out a team. So started to hire and started to go more laser focused on B2B because I love the linear thinking of the transactions. Um, I came from a world of B2C where I worked with companies like the Kit Kats of the world and Nestle's and was able to do some interesting projects across Canada where we collaborated with those companies. And I was like, this is cool, but I don't really feel like I can see clearly how I'm impacting the bottom line. Like this is interesting to me, 
but it's not really my jam. So I was like, okay, let's dive into the world of startups, started to work with some smaller SaaS companies. I was like, this is my jam. I love it. Like these organizations, when you approach it with storytelling, when you can create content that solves a problem, you can unlock some amazing returns and actually see the dollar impact. I love this. So I went all in on that, started to create more and more content on that nature, started to scale up. We started to attract more people. I started to hire a team, build out a team. And now today we're working with some of the biggest names in SaaS um, all over the globe, which has been amazing to kind of um, grow into. The HQ is based out of Halifax, Nova Scotia on the East Coast. So I spend a lot of time early on on planes traveling all across the Bay Area, all across Canada, the US and beyond. Um, but the HQ has always been on the East Coast of Canada in a small little place called Halifax that not a lot of people even realize that's where I'm from. Right on. Um, I have. I want to. I want to ask you about the early days of foundation. And you know, when I think of content for B two B, I think of it in one of two buckets. One is it's the superhero story, augmenting, making you, giving you superpowers, making you better, making you the hero of your organization. And the other one is right. more of like a, a pain avoidance, a painkiller, if yeah. you will. Um, yeah. You know, how do you think of those frameworks when you when you start working with smaller brands and um, start working on their brand stories that will inform and, uh, you know, inform their content distribution? Yeah, early on, like I always say, if you're creating content and you're early, you need to try to get the hit, right? Like even if you think about musicians, I like the, Adam, you'll resonate with this, but like I think when it comes to musicians, the most important thing early in your career is to try to get a hit. Like you try to get a hit with your pieces of content that ultimately allow you to start to be talked about within the industry. And when you're a bigger brand, you're playing a little bit more defense. Like it's easier to kind of produce mass scale, mediocre content. Like you're just trying to play a volume game to constantly be in the, the state of getting attention. But when you're early, you really need to get those hits. You want a piece of content that ultimately separates you from the entire industry. And for foundation, I'll take you into my world as like a founder. When we launched and we were kind of trying to build our own brand, we were looking for those hits. And one of the biggest hits that we had was we wrote a piece where we broke down the growth strategy behind companies like Canva and Masterclass. And we broke down into the nitty gritty details of like, this is exactly what they were thinking when they created these landing pages. This is the search intent that they used. We found emails and actually referenced and screenshotted the emails and broke down why certain emails that they were sending to acquire backlinks were strategic. We pressed publish on this piece of content and we had millions of dollars in pipeline that came on the back of these individual blog posts and that put us on the map. So oftentimes when we talk to startups, we encourage them to try to find the hits. You have to be willing to create something that is different from what everyone else in your industry is doing. You have to try to create a piece of content that is worth talking about, worth bookmarking, worth sharing and worth retweeting to a point where your competitors look at it and they're like, how in the world did they create that piece of content? That's the level and that's the bar that I think startups early on need to be striving for. And it's not easy. That's the biggest challenge. Like it's, um, it's not an easy job. Like this is going to sound like I'm putting myself out of work, but I don't think agencies can actually create a lot of that content for these startups. Like I think they actually need to have the mental capacity in house or like an expert in house, or they're collaborating with someone who is so deeply engaged in their space to actually bring that stuff to life. I love that answer. And um, I think what you hit on is the notion of something um, our friend Seth Godin likes to say, remarkable, right? It's right, worth right. remarking yeah, yeah. on, it's worth commenting on. It's a mm. marketing cliche. Some cliches are cliche for a reason because yeah. um, they're important. And um, so if j just, to, just to linger on, this for a minute because I, I loved everything what you said about finding a hit early and you yeah. know creating momentum and you know some snowball effect and people excited to hear what right. you're going to say next, your next feature launch, whatever that was, you know, yeah. that's happening next. Like people want to see what happens after. Um, how do you advise it's like smaller brands who are sort of just getting their feet wet. It, yeah. do, do you want them to create this awesome piece of flagship mm. content right away? Do you want them to sort of have the right. basics in place and to have like basic processes and analytics and email right. and search set up? Like, do you have to have the house built first or should you try and just go for a win and then sort of 
yeah. go, go from there. Is, is there a triage that you see? I think the biggest question is like, what do the resources like look, the resources look like internally first, right? Like if you're an up and coming startup that's bootstrapping or you've only got a small seed round, like stop worrying about all of the last click attribution and, oh, we need to buy every single ABM software. We need to purchase every single analytics report that's, it doesn't need to be that complicated. In the early days, all you're trying to do is create content that shapes culture within the spaces in which you navigate. And that doesn't require much to kind of say, is this working? Besides, okay, are you getting traction? Are you seeing leads? Are you getting buzz? Are more and more people calling you? Those things don't need sophistication, really. You just need to like go to the market, embrace great storytelling. And then I think you also have to embrace distribution. Like a lot of brands are suffering because they do create great content, but they don't do anything with it. Like the whole idea of content marketing has been around for a long time. And I think one of the fundamental issues that has happened over the last few years is that all the gurus have told the world, create content, create content, write content, ship content, and the world will be yours without actually thinking about the marketing of that content. Like we've gone into a space where it's no longer content marketing, it's just content. We have to market the content that we're creating right? Like you have to amplify the stories that you're telling and get them into the right channels. And that is oftentimes missed. Creating remarkable content is ridiculously important, but no one can make a remark on it if they never read it. And that's the problem. Like people don't realize you need people to read the content that is remarkable, right? Like you can't just expect the world to hear you if you're not spreading your story. And I think that would be my advice is like early on, Focus on creating that remarkable content and then get exhausted promoting it and distributing it until you realize, okay, our audience is fatigued. And then at that point, you should be on to the next one. And then you go live with that and start to see, did this work? Did this resonate? Okay, it did. Great. On to the next one. Let's repurpose. Let's repackage this. And as time goes on, you're able to resurface and reshare old pieces. Like it's another mistake that people make where it's like, oh, we press publish on this piece in Q1 2022 and we can't share it again in Q1 2024. What? Reshare it. Get some new updated stats. Get some new updated images, throw in a new little insight around the latest technology that changed in the industry and share that same content with the new audience that you've grown over the last year. People don't think that way. And I think it's a major mistake. And I think uh, a lot of the stuff that you're 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 mentioning right now kind of echoes a lot of the sentiments shared by like uh, one of my heroes, Rand Fishkin, founder of Moz, mm. uh, when he, I think he called it like 10X content. And I'm sure yeah. uh, a lot of our ideas came around from that same time. It's a, it's about a, right. that idea is about seven or eight years old, but yeah. Um, Great piece, legacy what, what, piece, what, what, love the throwback. Legacy piece. Yeah. But like one thing that uh, I remember you, I, 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 I think it was you that said it, but it was like create once distribute forever. Yeah. And I, I yeah. thought that was just absolutely such a succinct and stunningly like great piece of uh, anecdotal Appreciate feedback it. for any marketer. Yeah. Um, and I think the key is like forever is a very long time. And I intentionally say forever because we think that this stuff should end. But like I have pieces of content that I created in 2015 that I will reshare today with a few updated tweaks, adjustments, et cetera. And it will result in new leads, new prospects, new clients, right? Like great content, remarkable content lasts for a very long time. And if you can just inject a little bit of new life, a little bit new flavor, recognizing shifts in culture, shifts in stories, et cetera, then you have an opportunity to really have a lasting impact on the audiences that you're trying to connect with. I, I think that's awesome advice. And one hard thing for not just brands, but people is, is, is their, their sort of egos. And, and yeah. I, I mean this actually in a good way, right. they publish something and they assume the world has seen it. And they yeah. don't share it again because yeah. they're like, I've already seen this or I've already right. published it. And they forget the internet is huge. Right. And so, um, you know, I've actually, don't tell anyone, I've taken some of my very old blog posts and I sort yeah. of redrafted them, updated them, right. and I published them to Substack because now I have a new Brilliant. audience there since I sold Brilliant. my old blog. Yeah. And, um, you know, no one... Um, you know, no one knows. No one knows. <laughs> You've exposed it now. But I mean, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like that's the play that... That's the benefit of creating online. Like you can take your old ideas, fine tune them a bit, give them back to the audience that you want to connect with. And it drives a ton of results. Like how has that worked for you? Like, are you seeing, like, 
how many people reply to your sub stacks that you do that with and are like, oh, Adam, I've read this before. Well, the reason I can do that is because it's, you know, my voice and, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's different than taking, you know, chat GPT content where it's automated. And um, that I, I feel like there's like a risk there that mm. that feels less authentic. Yeah, I agree. I 100% agree. I think that's real. Like the, there's a lack of nuance and voice that happens when you embrace those like AI tools that can't be replicated at this point. Maybe in the future, they'll be able to do it. But I think today it's not feasible for them to replicate the human touch. And that's where I think marketers should actually put their stake in the ground and say, AI can't replace me because AI can't replace my style. Um, and there's certain elements that they won't be able to like replicate. Like it might eventually get that smart, but today I think the human touch is, is still key. There's also things that GPT can't ingest into its training corpus, which is like, what questions do salespeople get asked a million times on every single prospecting call, right? And right. so like, when when I think of great ideas to build content around, or, you know, if you're a growth person building like a engineering is marketing tool, if, uh, you know, if you come out of the the world where you read like, you know, uh, Gabriel Weinberg, founder of DuckDuckGo and Justin Morris, yeah. who did a uh, I think he's got kettle and fire the bone broth company now he's like a yeah, yeah, entrepreneur. Yeah. but but they right. always focused on you know telling that story using one of these 19 traction channels but mm. the best way to go about it the, the the thing to start thinking about building first is like what can't you get answered with content right. on the internet right now that lives yeah. or is gated somewhere else and so like that's it going back to what a adam said like we we built our billboard cost calculator probably like four right. or five years ago, they made up, yeah. it made up for like 35% of all queries related to it. outdoor advertising. Yeah. And I always forget that this is still a valuable and useful tool for everybody yeah. who just discovered AdQuick. Right. And so it's true. there's a lot of validity to what you're saying. Yeah. It's interesting. Like you folks come from an interesting world because you're on like a, a blend of considered old world and new world, right? Like the billboard idea and the billboard concept has been around for a long time social though and that entire scape is still relatively new but here's what i find the most interesting it's the blend of those two worlds that actually present a ridiculous opportunity that people still sleep on the viral tweet the viral post the content that it goes and resonates with people on social is a low-cost opportunity to get content market fit for a billboard campaign and like that is completely overseen by so many people today. I think it's like a major, like major unlock for brands to be able to take concepts that are resonating online, take that as like your sample size and then blow it up on like billboard. Because what happens with billboards that a lot of people don't realize is it is actually a great driver of more social content. People want to take a picture of it if it's good and then they share it on social and you'll get even more impressions because it was on a billboard to begin with. And that to me is like this weird interesting space that not a lot of people are talking about but still presents in my opinion like a major unlock if brands start to think that way if they start to view it less in the old way and how you can like make it a world of like integration across all oh the, the power there is crazy yeah it's super cool i think what you said is is spot on to use social and the internet as a, a petri dish to experiment right. and whether it's for a billboard, whether it's like a message or whether it's, you know, a short video you create, yep. see what gets engagement in social and then use that yep. for the larger mass channels. Because obviously, you know, social is, you know, your, your niche feed, it's curated, it's mm -hmm. algorithmic, you're not going to reach everyone. But yep. if you can use that to figure out what would work at scale and is worth putting real dollars behind, exactly. those spends are going to be so much more efficient. Yeah. Um, and like use Reddit for that stuff too, right? Like Reddit to me is like another one of those places where it's like, Ooh, marketers get all the heebie jeebies when you talk about market I, Reddit. I love Reddit. I've been banned like a hundred times, but I still <laughs> love Reddit. And the reason is like, you can go into a specific subculture, understand the things that they care about, understand the things that they are struggling with, that they love, that they adore, that they hate. And you can just sort that by top posts and so deeply understand that space where you can, if you reverse engineer all of the posts for the last like five years within a subreddit, a subculture, you can crack the code on what stories this audience wants every single time. And then if you apply that to, okay, 
this is where my audience is. I now have distribution channels set up where I can tell them this story with our brand voice on TV, on YouTube, on Quora, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and then you blast it. There's such a reduced level of risk because you validated whether or not this idea works by actually studying the community. And I think like you take that insight, you throw it on a billboard. Amazing. You throw it into a Twitter thread. Amazing. You throw it into a LinkedIn update, a YouTube video, whatever it may be. And you've already reduced the risk of backlash or that the thing doesn't resonate because you've already done the research. Um, yeah, I think there's a ton of insight around like that Petri dish model with different communities on the internet and just like using that to, to test and validate your ideas. I, I also like how when you speak about you know, ideas cross channel, you, you're really focusing on the idea itself and abstracting away the channel. Cause at the end of the day, it's still all two humans. It's still all That's two it. users. So right. I, I, when I was a consultant, which I'm not anymore, right. I would try, whenever we were brainstorming ideas and concepts and narrative for the quarter, they'd be like, they'd be focused on an infographic or a blog post. I'm like, no, right. no, 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 we're not there. We're going right. to figure out the narrative we're going to tell. And yeah. then we're going to work on all of yeah. the tactics underneath it. Right. So, yeah. Um, I think marketers get obsessed with their channels because they're shiny and they're fun. But, um, you know, thinking back from, you know, stories where we just right. launched a new ad campaign. Now we're, cool. you know, trying to rehabilitate marketers. Yep. So now all of my content is going to be about rehabilitating marketers. Right. Um, we're going to sound like the old guys when I say this, but like, I think this is because a lot of the marketers who are coming into the market today are coming in through, and I think it's still great through YouTube videos, through online courses and like tactical things where it's like, here's how you grow your Twitter account to 50,000. And then that's all they stay focused on. They're not actually getting the training and the, the lessons of the fundamentals of marketing anymore. They're just like seeing the dollar sign. They're seeing the total amount of money that they can make in this industry. And then they're just jumping into a course about how to become a YouTube influencer and make 150K a year. And they're like, okay, this is it. I just need to like create a title, a clickbait, like type of um, video and like just create this thing. I need a cool thumbnail where I look like Mr. Beast, blah, 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 replicate his strategy and then I'll be successful. And then they try to apply that to businesses that like don't have the cloak, don't have the same background, don't have the same history, an audience that might not resonate with that same style. And they have forgot completely the fundamentals of marketing 101. Um, and I think that's kind of losing a lot of like the reason why a lot of people are struggling in this space is like they're forgetting the fundamentals. And I, so I love Mr. Beast, by the way. One thing that so blew my so mind. Do I. I gotta throw is, that out. I do love him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> Respect. So I no see, hate. Yeah. I see all the people doing exactly what you say, like copying Mr. Beast, like thumbnail style or, right. or, or video cuts, you know, doing those hot cuts, which I think are fun. But I don't, I, from a marketer, the marketer in me is like, wait you wouldn't want to copy Mr. Beast because right. you're never going to be Mr. Beast. Like why not right. create your, if you're going to go to the effort of learning how to edit video of learning how to grow a following online of all of these things and write scripts, why would you copy someone else? It's like, True. you're instantly, you're, mm. you're instantly at zero from like right. an interest and novelty perspective. You're basically devaluing everything to be right. a clone of someone else. When one thing that I've realized as a marketer, um, in the internet age is your risk is yeah. blending in. It is not standing mm. out. Like you should lean into your weirdness, right. find like the weird parts of your company. And those sort of things that differentiate you are, are what make you interesting and it's people true. don't get it. And, and then they end up sounding just like everyone else. And now you're back in the mix with the boring B2B marketers yeah. that are writing white papers to oblivion. No one reads, right? Right, right. It's interesting. Like that is definitely a risk. And I think it's a risk across all channels and all industries, right? Like if you look at, if you constantly are looking at the people who are the most successful and you're trying to emulate them to a T and you're just replicating their strategies and techniques and then you start to get traction, guess what? The person below you is looking at you and saying, oh, I want to do the same thing. And then it just becomes a bit of a like, oh, I see what you're doing. I'm going to do the same thing. And it's just like a cycle of people creating the same stories. Like we all see them on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Like everything sounds the same. If, if you take your avatar away from the content that you just produced and throw someone else's on it, does it still feel the same? That's what the brands really need to ask themselves. Like go across your industry and say, could we swap our logo with what they're saying? And they swap their logo with what we're saying. And it still feel like it's the same. 
And if the answer is yes, then you're probably not doing anything that stands out or differentiates to a point where you're actually going to be memorable, better yet, remarkable to your point earlier. Like, I think it's a, it's a real challenge that brands don't think about enough, um, especially in the early days. I, I love it. I love the what you said about switching avatars or logos and being like, could you even tell, right? Right. Um, right. Like, because for any iconic brand, you know, like if you remove the Apple logo, you still know what Think Different is, right? So it's kind of the reverse where, you know, their logo is so iconic, but also their taglines are iconic too. Yeah, um, exactly. And Chris mentioned like create once, distribute forever. I say that all the time intentionally because I want people to associate that concept with me. And I simply put up that post probably back in 2018. It got traction. I was like, great. I have content market fit. This idea resonated with people. So I'm going to go all in on this concept. Every time I talk about distribution, I'm going to end that post with something around create once, distribute forever. And whenever I do that, now what I'm seeing is like more and more people are saying those exact same words. And now what they don't realize is they're giving my brand additional credibility, additional reach. And I love it. So like those are simple ideas where it's like find something that you can consider a tagline, throw it and align it with your business and consider that like a content theme. So anything that I talk about around distribution, somewhere within, I'm probably going to say create once, distribute forever. Some people are going to be annoyed by it. They're going to say, oh my goodness, I've heard you say this a million times, a million times. Yeah, but there's millions of people that exist that have not heard it. So I'm going to keep saying it. And then you think about other ideas and concepts that you can start to associate with your brand and start to reiterate those over and over and over again. And the more that you do that, the more mental memory you're going to create in your audience to say, wow, Ross is the create once, distribute forever person. He always is saying that I'm going to associate distribution with them. Ross taught me how to do distribution because I'm saying the same thing over and over again. A lot of brands also play the shiny ball syndrome where it's like, oh, I like this idea. I'm going to talk about it for a day or two, and then I'm never going to talk about it again. Same story, different week, different quarter, over and over again, rinse and repeat. That's how Nike builds this brand. Just do it. Concept talked about forever. Everybody is still excited by that idea. They've said it millions of times, but we still get inspired by it. And the same with Think Different, right? Like you have to find those ideas that have content market fit and then tell those ideas consistently to your audience. And the beauty of that 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 message is it, it's so applicable to B2, for B2B companies, even as they grow, right? So as right. you get larger, you let's say you go from 100 to 1,000 employees, you slap right. on some new products and you start offering them to new segments that create once and distribute forever is still valid. It's just you're you know distributing it forever to a, a segment. Exactly. It's not your core segment anymore, but right. a lot of the a lot of the value propositions are still relevant. That's what that's yeah. what's great about it. That's it. I appreciate it. I think that's the key. It's like you the message transcends across all sizes, all shapes and companies, even all types of creators, right? Like even whether I'm talking to a musician or I'm talking to an artist or I'm talking to a SaaS company with a $1.5 billion market cap, they need to hear the idea of create once, distribute forever because we all get into this place of fear where we don't want to promote our things because we're not in the mood. We all get into this place of fear where it's like, I don't want to keep promoting this. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be considered that guy. When in reality, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Half the people weren't even online yesterday when you promoted that. Thing. So promote it anyway, promote it, amplify it, distribute it, let the world see it. And the world will actually reward you if the thing that you are promoting is high value. If it's high value, if it's a 10x content asset, the world will be happy that you're sharing it. Because right now, as someone listens to us have this conversation, I can guarantee you that some of your listeners have created pieces of content that someone out there would actually be able to consume and have a fundamentally different life if they actually took the time to promote it. But because they won't promote their work, because they're too afraid to be judged, because they're fearful of one of their friends unfollowing them on Twitter or LinkedIn, somebody struggling with a problem that they could help themselves. And to me, that's the ultimate, like ultimate reason why you should promote your content and be happy to do so. That's really what it comes down to. Ross is going to make me feel bad for I want never, you to. never sharing my art to. online because of that exact problem. <laughs> I do want that, you to. It's the so music, hard. It's so hard. I can't do it. I can't do it. You gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta um, do it. To switch gears a little bit. Um, oh, Chris, you want to? 
Go, did you have? Well, I, I was just about one? to su suggest switching gears and kind of going uh, to the opposite end of the spectrum, which is like the expert level promoter, which is speaking and doing keynotes. And I, mm. I know that Ross is is deep in the conference circuit and he he uh, he, he shares the stage with a lot of our friends. And I, w I just wanted to get an understanding of like, how do you get into this world? And like, uh, how do you, how do you like, what, it, what is the state of B2B, you know, event and field right. marketing right now? I love it. So I want everybody, some people listening to this is, are about to leave because they're like, I'm shy. I'm an introvert. I don't want to do public speaking. So I'm, I'm not going to listen anymore. And I want you to stop because my nickname in junior high and early high school was shy Ross. I was not an extrovert. I'm still not really an extrovert, but my nickname was literally Shy Ross because I didn't speak. I didn't raise my hand. I didn't talk to my own friends. If we were in a classroom, I was not talking to anyone. I was a very, very shy person. Probably, I'd say the last year of high school, I came across an article because I was starting to pick what I wanted to do in university. And I picked marketing and I picked business. And I was like, how do you become successful in this marketing thing in business? And in that article, it said that you should be good at public speaking. And I can't turn blue or red. I'm always the same. But I would have, if I could, I would have been a whole different color because I was so afraid that I made the wrong decision. So I was like, okay, I, I need to learn how to do public speaking. This is not me. This isn't something that I do. How in the world am I going to figure this out? So I started to sign up, not for Toastmasters, not for any of those. I went completely to the other end of the spectrum. And I just started to sign up to speak at different events, just throwing my hat in the ring at local events. I want to talk about social media. I want to talk about digital. I want to talk about Google. I want to talk about Ask Jeeves. I want to talk to these audiences about these things that are happening. The first time I did it, I was a sweaty mess. I learned a very valuable lesson in that moment that you should never wear a white shirt because I was completely see-through at the end of that. I had sweated so far through my pits, through my chest. Everything was visible. It was a sweaty mess but I kept signing up. I kept signing up to do more and more talks, more and more talks. And eventually I got decently good. I got decently good because I started to view this as something that I needed to do if I wanted to be successful. I didn't know enough about the industry to know that, yes, you can just get a desk job and never speak in front of people and be okay in your career. I read that article and I was like, I need to become good at public speaking. So I went all in. I booked a room at a library. I didn't have a ton of money where I could book like a fancy coach or anything like that. I went to a library. I brought my laptop. My laptop was being held together with duct tape. It was probably a fire hazard for the entire building. And I watched all of the comedians, all of the top comedians in the world. And I actually wrote down trends that I was seeing and the way that they delivered presentations. And I was studying like the actual greats of comedy. And that was it because I didn't know any marketers. I didn't know business people. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know who Steve Jobs was. I didn't know any of that. So I studied the people who I knew gave talks, which were comedians. I studied like Martin Luther King, his approach to doing presentations. And I was writing notes on how they do presentations. So I studied the game of speaking. And then I started to continue to apply to speak at more and more marketing conferences and talk about the things that I was learning as I grew my career. And eventually I started to record it. And as I recorded those presentations, it gave me material that I could start to send to event organizers all over the globe. So I started to send those to event organizers and I got shut down time and time and time again from all these event organizers saying, no, you're not ready. Sorry, we don't approve your topic. I was trying to talk about B2B. They were like, no, nobody cares about this, et cetera. It's not interesting. And then I was like, okay, how do I shift my approach here? I need to kind of build up my own brand and my own like reputation a bit in the industry. So I started to go into communities like growthhackers.com at the time was very big inbound.org was a community online yeah. today if you're a marketer i would say like find the slack communities in your niche the facebook groups in your niche and i just started to contribute a ton of ideas and slowly but surely marketers around the globe started to recognize my name and recognize this idea that when somebody asked a question in these communities i didn't just give a one line answer i was going in depth i was providing all of the insights all of my ideas tactical steps i was going above and beyond with my replies and from that I got people saying, you know your stuff. Like, would you be interested in coming to speak at this event? Could you come down and speak at this conference? And then as I applied those fundamentals that I learned from like studying the comedians to this marketing world, people started to say, wow, this is kind of different. Like the way that he presents, the way he speaks is different. Can you do this again? Can you come into my company and do this? And then I just started to build up more and more 
badges for conferences by being invited to go and speak at these conferences. And at the time, I can remember like when I really started to grasp the marketing space, studying the marketing presentations that were like breaking the internet. And I would be like, hmm, what is so good about these? And again, applied the like best practices and reverse engineered what they do. And I realized that it's the talks that have a bit of strategy, but a whole bunch of tactics that people love every single time. So I started to apply that methodology to my talks and to my keynotes. And over time, the demand just continued to increase. And it became very interesting when my, at one point, like, marketing idols became marketing peers. And then you start going on stage with people that at one point you studied and admired and read all of their content and learned from, and then you're an equal on the stage at the same time. And that's been a very rewarding and mind bending experience to go through. That was a long answer, yeah. but no, I, I love that. A, a bit of a better spectrum of how it all has gone. Do, do you know what Ross makes it look super easy, but then you hear the story of him, you know, watching all of these, you know, comedians and taking notes. I actually think that's so smart is to sometimes like you can get better inspiration and, and, yeah. and be, you know, different. If, if you take like this, you know, different approach to learning different something. Things. And and now you have probably a, a more valuable skill because now you're not thinking like everyone in the room anyway, or right. presenting like everyone in the room in your case. Yeah. Yeah. And I for, for all of our, uh... no, I was just going to say, I always get asked, did you take Toastmasters or anything like that? And it's like, no, like Toastmasters was like my own self-created MBA of like sweat, struggle, failure in public and studying the comedians game. But yeah, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. I was going to say for, for all of our Gen Z listeners that don't know what a library is, it's the OG work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. It's so you just true. have to walk uphill in the snow to go to a library. <laughs> That's it. That's yeah, it. It's exactly. true. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, like, what's the, what's the conference scene like right now? Because I know we shut the world down. Every, and then, like, when we opened back up, everybody was thrilled to get back, you yeah. know, get back in person, start shaking yeah. hands and doing deals at conferences. Right. Has that excitement level uh, remained consistent? Like, what, what are you seeing out there? It's still, it exists now and people are actually like back to, it's not completely back, right? Like it's not completely back where the sense of like, everybody's hugging, everybody's like all in your face, handshakes, blah, blah, blah. If somebody coughs, people still like look the other way. Like some, it's still not the same. And I don't know how long it's going to take for it to ever get back to the same, but it's different for sure. Um, but the energy is real. And when I say the energy is real, what I mean is like people are excited to see colleagues and peers and people who they can talk about this stuff with in the flesh again. And I think that energy is new because before it was like an annual thing. Oh, I seen you last year. Great. I seen you last year. We had a gap and now people are like, getting together, reunion, there's new faces that are showing up at events because there's been a three-year gap where like people have changed careers, industries have changed, and those people are like being introduced to the spaces for the first time. And it's refreshing always to kind of have new blood in a market and in a space. And I think it's uh, starting to heat up. Um, I don't think, maybe I'm just, again, getting older, but I don't think it's as like party, 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 like it used to be. I think that's gone, um, but it might come back too. But I feel like that is kind of, pe people, maybe it's just my circle, but people are no, going no. to bed earlier for the, sure. The Fed, when the Fed brings <laughs> rates too. back to 0%, um, yeah. everyone will be partying again. We're, we're not ready for that part of the cycle yet. <laughs> not ready for that, no. It will, it will happen again. We'll, we'll yeah. all... I'm not, I'm not living in San Francisco again, but we'll be back yeah. there at an event together at some point. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. It's so um, true. Speaking of, I, I want to shift gears and ask your opinion on something else. So Ross, I noticed you're like, everyone has succumbed to whatever brand of tribal warfare, you yeah. know, because of algorithms rewarding engagement because right. the world kind of lost its mind for a while. Yeah. And so I feel like you're one of the few people I've, I've never seen sort of get involved right. in the, the, the culture wars and, you know, yeah. and, and not even just politics, just in general, yeah. like this, this, this urge for everyone to bicker online. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is um, what would you say to brands? Should they take advantage of right. some of the tribal stuff, should they be playful with it? Is there too much yeah. of a risk? How are you advising clients on that? Because it seems like it could be an opportunity or it yeah. could not. I'm curious your thoughts. On a human level, 
I find a drama-free life to be the biggest aspiration <laughs> worth pursuing. Having little drama in my life is a life that I want. I do not want to have a ton of drama in my life. That's something that I strive for. And I strive to avoid people who constantly want to stir up a whole bunch of drama constantly time and time again, because ain't nobody got time for that. There's a lot of big problems. There's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of obstacles. And if you're sweating the little stuff that don't really matter, then it, to me, it's a waste of energy. For organizations, I think it comes down to your core values. Every organization ultimately was created and founded with a certain type of core values. And those core values are going to be across a wide spectrum. Some organizations have very, very, very conservative values. Some have very, very liberal values. And you have to really just understand what is the vision of this organization and what it's trying to represent. And if it is on these spectrums of like being very one way or another way and very vocal on one right or this right or this left or whatever it may be, then you have to just ask yourself, is that the story that you want to tell? Is it going to add value to your brand? Is it going to help you attract a certain type of person? Is that what you want from your brand and your message? And if the answer is yes, then pursue it, go for it. As long as you can sleep well at night and you are comfortable with that and the repercussions and the impact and the influence that it has on you, the world, the community, the industry, the space, the people that you serve, work with, et cetera, then that's the bed that you have decided to sleep in. And I can understand that. And from my perspective, I can get the strategic decision that some organizations make to go one way or the next. Personally, in my world, as a marketer, as a creator, I don't feel like I need to necessarily be in that world of like, people will be arguing on Twitter over certain SEO things all the time. And it's like, this isn't worth arguing about. It's literally not argue, worth arguing about. Someone will argue over the most ridiculous things and that energy you will never get back. So for me, it's like you have to pick your battles and you have to figure out like where you want to allocate your energy. And for me, I try to avoid the internet drama, the internet beef, and just stay focused on my priorities for my business, my company, my family, my friends, and that's it. And if the internet drama tries to suck me in, I'll wish somebody well, send them some kisses and hope that they do well in whatever they are in pursuit of. Um, it's not really something that I'm willing to kind of get chased into. It's Ross a, is playing energy. the internet on the correct mode. I try. I try. It's not always easy though. Like some people will throw you some very triggering items, right? Like I was on a webinar giving an, a webinar and I don't know if I've, I've never talked about this on a podcast, but someone dropped the M bomb on the pot on the webinar. And I was like, say what? Like sweat again, remember the sweaty Ross that came out fully. And I was like, Oh, I'm about to tell this person where to go and how to get there. But the mods jumped in, they got rid of them and it was gone. And it was like a thing, but like, those are real things that happen that can definitely Take someone who might feel pretty stoic and like calm and just be like, all right, now I'm now I'm here. Um, and I think that's the nasty part of the internet. Some people on the internet just want to rile you up. They just want to fire you up. And we're not all perfect, myself included, where it's not always going to be easy to not respond to those. But sometimes, like, sometimes you do have to tell people where to go and how to get Yeah, what, what is yeah. it like... Uh, Wild said, uh, never wrestle a pig. Uh, you right. both get dirty and the, and the pig That's likes it. it. That's <laughs> it. It's true. That is a great quote. I have never heard that in my life, but I love that quote. Sorry, I lost the internet for a second. Hopefully that wasn't weird for you guys. Um, no. I was going to ask about, you know, I, I think the reason a lot of it happens is the same reason that you have young marketers specifically like, going to create 50,000 followers for mm. a brand on a certain channel, they, right. they're using it to hit a metric school and not thinking through the all of the second, third, fourth order effects of the right. perception of that company in the world. And that's what happens when you get a marketing sector that is maybe like over-indexed on yeah. KPIs and data. So I guess that leads to my next question, Well, is how do you balance, you know, wanting to hit numbers and, 
um, all at the same time, yeah. still have the right amount of creativity and not just having 10 calls to action on a post and spamming people, right? It's not easy. It's tough, right? Like I think the balance is um, it's really a, a personal decision that everyone needs to make. Like how far are you willing to go to get where you want to be? Like how far are you willing to go to like achieve a certain thing? And are you willing to kind of lose yourself in some ways sometimes in pursuit of a certain goal and ambition? Um, and it can be very intriguing and interesting when you see some of the growth numbers that someone might get for being extremely controversial nonstop over and over again. But for me, it's like, yeah, that's one, I don't even resonate with the story, the message that they're using to amplify and grow. And then two, it's like, I think my mom still follows me on Twitter, so I'm not going to say anything like that. So it's like, there's a there's an interesting balance that I think everyone needs to, to figure out for themselves around like, what story do you actually want to tell? And are you comfortable with embracing a single story that you're aligned with instead of like just chasing the metrics, chasing those KPIs. But I think you're spot on. Like as someone who has also like been able to build their brand out I'd be curious to know like for you, what's your take on it? How do you think of like navigating that world? Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I've found that certain topics that I personally don't find to be political or controversial right. end up being crazy and right. you know right. like generating a ton of discussions and ending up in media stories right. and so i think what's interesting is everyone's definitions of yeah, a true. lot of different things has been ha have been like the overton window has been moved right yeah. like normally where you would be a centrist on a given issue not even a political issue just right. like in the middle about something the narrative has moved so far left mm. or so far right either due to algorithm algorithms or news or world events or, true. or whatever and 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 so you end up like i end up the situations i get into the most trouble are the situations where i'm not even necessarily trying but right. i'm i'm not part of the narrative and, and right. i i've lost pace with it yeah. and but but sometimes when that's the case i i i i won't i don't give into the mob i'm like no you know what i'm yeah. looking at this from first principles i'm a rational thinker there's right. nothing here that's bad for the world you know maybe yeah. the rest of you have lost your minds and um <laughs> that could be true too yeah chris what do you think how do you approach it I I mean, the easiest, I mean, I get triggered. I'm, 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 I'm short tempered and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, very animated. Let's put it that way. But the yeah. way I, I kind of keep myself out of trouble online is, uh, the best thing that Twitter ever created is, uh, the mute mute function. Mm, and so right. as soon as, right. as soon as I start feeling that this is going to take over my feed, true block Go on. and yeah. Then yeah. I'm not thinking about it. That's I think I have, I, I've got to have 10,000 people on muted island I now, love just, it. <laughs> just talking to themselves. <laughs> that's amazing. That's so, amazing. That's a, that's a great a challenge. Also, that's a great challenge to also see. I don't really have a big weird. personal brand. So like, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't right. a, a terrible concern for me. I'm also it, an introvert, but I like to, I like to just showcase, uh, showcase my work with numbers and revenue. Right. I and if, if, if you have thick skin, don't block your haters because they'll True. keep commenting and help you in the True. algorithms. So right. just mute them and you never even see them. And they're like helping <laughs> you, you know, surface your content. I'm sure I have like people saying ridiculous things, but after right. a certain point, you know, yeah. um, people realize they're just crazy humans on the internet and they're not yeah. taken seriously. So. so true. It's so true. And what happens or, is interesting. And this is something that I even advise with brands. It's like at a certain point, you have built a community. And when you do have that community, a special thing happens where even if you have trolls, even if you have people who are constantly nagging and like trying to rip you down and like tear you down and hate on your work, the community will take care of those people. And that's when you have something special, where if somebody says something negative to you in your replies and you start to see someone who is a fan start to come to bat for you, that's where the magic happens. And it happens in business all the time. Small businesses on Yelp, small businesses on Google Review, they'll get a negative comment where someone's saying, oh, their butter toast is horrible. And then 20 people are like, you're out of your mind. Their butter toast is the most delicious thing ever. Have you like, where were you? And that's exactly what you want to see happen. That community applied to personal brands or even consumer brands or B2B brands can be a very, very powerful thing. 
Yeah. One, one of the things that we say internally here at AdQuick is like, you know, don't worry about the ankle biters or the people talking junk. Just focus on right. the customer and ship it, shipping good products. I love that. I love that. Um, Ross, so you're on the agency side. So I'm, I'm curious in the modern landscape, because I haven't been a consultant in a number of years. Um, yeah. Is there any advice for any marketers listening here that want, mm. if, if they have like no senior leadership that ever speaks in the media, that ever speaks at events, that ever is on social, and they're like, this is a good idea for our team to be present. Do you right. have any advice for how to get senior management not not the brand but the actual people at least some of them to be a voice in the industry and sell the value yeah there's two key things that i would recommend that you need to do if you're trying to sell to senior leadership why they should have like a vocal voice the first one is you want to recognize that anyone at a senior level probably has a little bit of ego and you have to figure out how can you leverage that to your own advantage and what i mean by that is look at five six seven eight nine ten competitors who might actually have someone on their senior leadership team that is doing the things that you would want to do or want your team to do and is absolutely crushing it or doing well enough to say, yeah, this person's getting some traction on LinkedIn. Look at how many of our ideal customers are actually engaging on this. Take screenshots of your actual customers commenting or liking their things and say, look, our senior leadership team isn't vocal on these channels, but our competitors are. And look at the traction. Look at our, our actual customers liking their content. Look at the people who are showing up for the webinar put on by the CFO and the CMO and the director of product. Look at the traction that our competitors are getting. I wish our senior, you don't have to say, I wish that's going to potentially stir up some really rough feelings, but you can say to them, like, why aren't we doing this? Like, why aren't you folks doing it? Once that happens and that narrative is in front of them, they'll probably have some conversations at the senior level. And what you should do is make it easy for them to say, yes, we should do that. Now, here's how you make it easy for them. You say that and you kind of develop a plan around how you can make their life easier to actually execute on that vision. And the way that you do that is two key ways interviews and actually creating content days. So interviews are a simple way where you say to them, look, we know that you're an expert in this topic. I have outlined using a tool like SparkToro or something like that, all of these different podcasts where our competitors have actually been on. We can reach out to all of these podcasts on your behalf and we'll get you featured. And all we're going to ask on the other end of that podcast is for the recording so we can chop it up, few key points that you've shared, and we're going to distribute that on your LinkedIn on your behalf. Does that sound like a good plan to you? They'll probably say yes. If that is great, then run with it. If that isn't possible because there's not a lot of podcasts in your industry and in your space, the next option is to simply go to ChatGPT and say, hey, can you give me 30 questions that someone would be interested in within our space, blah, 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 that our ICP would be interested in? Or you listen to sales calls and start to ask like, what are questions that oftentimes come up with our customers? And then you get a list of those questions. You book a room, maybe it's over Zoom, and you actually ask those questions to your senior leadership team and you give them the questions in advance so they're prepped and they're able to be articulate and then they answer those questions on camera. Once they answer those questions on camera, you now, let's say you have 30 videos, five minutes each, two minutes each for every answer. You now have hundreds of minutes of content that you can now take and start to chop and skew into a wide range of different topics and material for your senior leadership team to distribute and amplify. You can take those video clips and turn them into reels, into TikToks, into LinkedIn posts, et cetera. You can take the transcripts of those and then turn them into threads, into blog posts, into other content. And every single time you can put your senior leadership team's name on it so they have the authority, but they also are going to be incentivized to promote it through their channels, to send it to prospects, to send it to leads. It's coming from them. The authority on that content is higher. That's the playbook that I would run if I was in a seat where I was working in a company where the senior leadership team didn't really realize it. Step one, tap into their ego and show them what how good it could be if they were doing it. And then two, make it easy for them to actually contribute through either running a podcast tour or setting up a content day that is very easy for them to take part in. And you can ultimately do the rest of the work to distribute that content. I love the idea of of leading with ego. Um, <laughs> you, you know, I've in the past I've made such wonky arguments. Not that I'm at a team now where everyone's on social, so it's fine. Right. But in right. the past, I've said things like, 
you know we're selling a commodified good, right? So the only <laughs> reason people want to buy from us is they know you. Like right. they're going to go buy from the guy they know. They like that guy. They want to support him. But it's like I'm getting into like, yeah. you know, buzzword stuff. They're like, well, can't you just run more ads? I'm like, fine. Just give me right. more money. But I, I love the idea of leading with ego. I think like, mm-hmm. um, you know, what is it? Tim Cook will respond to every email someone sends him, right? right. Like right. and they're the highest value company in the world and it's not beneath <laughs> Tim. So yeah. why is it beneath your team to go film a few videos, right? Exactly. So it's actually a red flag for me of like mm. working at a company where the team's not on social. Like, you know, right. I, I joined that quick because Chris is here on social. I'm like, so right. I can read Chris's thoughts yeah. like of every, not that I, I followed him already, but like I can see right. all his thoughts on the company and yeah. I could like tell during the day, does he hate his life? No, he loves right. working here. So it's going to be fun. So yeah. it's like free information and True. um Yeah. Yeah. And it gives such an interesting perspective into culture. Like that's the other part. Like the don't only tap into ego, really lean into the possibilities because you're there. So not only are we going to have an opportunity to increase the amount of sales and revenue, but the talent that we get is going to be elevated and more closely aligned with our core values because I'm going to ask you a question about our company, about our culture, about our style and the way that we work. And that's going to give you a better opportunity to have a pipeline with amazing VPs, with amazing directors, amazing managers. The talent pipeline improves and it's also going to be easier to poach from competitors because you're vocal about your stories and your message. Like these are the little things that like actually the advice is now to just send this podcast to the person who you think should be on social because this should be all the ammo they need to know. You're going to increase your pipeline. You're going to increase your revenue and you're going to have better talent. If they don't care about those two things, got a different problem. But like, I, I, that's also a key part of it. I also, I, I loved your, um, I, I, I loved your uh, monologue on taking that one asset like that you have a really busy person that one you know 60 minute interview and turning it into a hundred things i mean that's really like the essence of when we were first doing digital marketing it was like you you had to like take that one idea and like matrix it out across all your channels because it it was a lot of time to make and you know i think that's one thing as there gets to be more channels that only becomes more true is how do you how do you get the most value from things um and and we were talking about sort of maybe you're a a junior marketer and you've only ever published YouTube or TikTok. Right, and right. Y- you know, you need to think about how you can answer the larger question of how you're going to be everywhere, online and offline. It's and true. then we get back to messaging being the most important thing. That's it. It's so true. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like the message is ultimately the key. It's like if the message is right. And I think we oftentimes even overthink about like how crisp it needs to be. If your exec team is adding a ton of value, it can be mediocre in terms of like the quality of the video. Um, You can record it on your phone. You can record it on your computer. If the content itself is high quality, you're, you're off into the races. The message is so important. Yeah. I I think, um, I think the notion of lo-fi has, it's totally in vogue, whether you're B2B or B2C. I think for so long, marketers spent so much money overly polishing everything and what that Mm. created is a world where you think it's an ad because it it, it's too polished whereas you get this like you know sometimes when you see like a like a ceo of i I think uh the starbucks ceo has done this where you just did like a selfie video and i listened i watched the whole thing and i'm like this is so much cooler than the cnbc interview because he's just talking to you it's not edited by anyone it's it's really authentic i know it's buzzword but it's true yeah. and it's so rare because you usually don't see fortune 500 companies yeah. with executives doing this which means it's like right. you would hope to see more people taking the advice you just gave about yeah. how to get get your brand out there probably even rare for a lot yeah. of pieces of b2b software where how could you make them less boring have the ceo tell the origin story that's it you yeah. just cracked something that i haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about but you're so right b2b doesn't do that yet B2C is all in on user-generated content. They are literally spending millions of dollars to get influencers to create what feels real as an ad and like feels real as an unboxing experience. But B2B isn't doing that yet. Like that is a very interesting play. And I think there's something there that is not actually happening today in B2B where that authenticity is not in play. Um that's interesting. Yeah, you have like you have your G twos and your your review forums, but those are all gamed right. and pay to play. So like that's not right. real. It's not real. <laughs> I guess it's I guess I guess real. those all happen behind closed doors in a exactly. text message for now. 
hey, what do you yeah. think about the software? Oh, avoid right. like the plague or whatever, you know? Yeah. Like imagine if you applied some of the fundamental principles of B2C where they're doing unboxings and you're having mm. someone like an Adam review a MarkTech software and just going in on it, right? Like authentic, real, transparent, that is different. And that would probably work well. And and it's funny if like you're if and if you're in B two B and your audience is marketers, uh, like the behind the scenes uh, element right. is super compelling. Um, and like I'll be completely honest, before we had Adam, uh, never shot a television commercial, right. never shot right. long form video to to have like a very like long brand story. And yeah. then he after after the commercial got wrapped up, he's like, oh, we're gonna do a behind the scenes, and I'm like, oh, I didn't even right. think of that. That's so sick. Right. right. Because like so much went into it and like mm. we shot the commercial in a scrapyard in Austin. Right. Like it was, yeah. <laughs> you know, there was a lot, That's a lot awesome. that went into it. And so right. uh, I'm sure that, you know, a lot of if your persona is very similar to what your role is at a, at a company, yeah. then uh, that, that can be equal that behind the scenes take or that right. that unpacking can be a can be a value as well. It's Chris true. Got Chris got to see that it takes 10 hours to film two minutes of content for an ad. <laughs> yeah. It's so wild. It's so true. And, and he was oh. in it. He got, he's in several of the, we shot a bunch of vignettes since we built a set and we scripted people. Um, Chris didn't want to be in the main ad because he realized yeah. that would have involved staying in the same place for 10 hours, but but he was there behind the scenes helping, you know, make That's stuff so happen. cool. That is cool. Is the ad online? Like, is it possible to see this thing? It is. Yeah. We're it supposed is. to be it's... plugging you, Ross, not, not the yeah, other way that's around. True. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> well, I'll, send, I'll send you a link after you'll like want to you'll want to see the cut that Chris is in, but nice. all of them, all of them are fun. Can't wait um, to see it. Ross, you do such cool threads mm. of quick tips. Do you want to leave our marketer audience Yes. with maybe two or three things to think about if they did nothing else in yep. this year to make their content marketing awesome. Happy to do it. So I think the first thing that I would recommend is going to go very much in line with the idea of create once distribute forever. So look at your content calendar, because a lot of you have probably heard us talk about like repurposing video, repurposing content, taking old content and sharing it. And you're thinking, how am I going to do this when I have to create so much content to re meet my quota for how many assets we need to produce every year? Ask yourself, like how many pieces do you actually need to create to achieve your goals versus how many pieces have you already developed over the last 24 months that at the time were gold, were amazing, were resonating with people, but maybe traffic started to dip, referral traffic started to tank simply because you didn't continue to distribute it or simply because you didn't optimize that content to continue to rank. Those are the things that you need to be thinking about. And what I would probably recommend is that you scale back on your creation efforts and scale up on your production of distribution assets. More tweets that are going to promote old content. More time to actually update a piece with a video that you might have created. You want to start to optimize and distribute your content instead of always being in this cadence of create, 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 create. And the second piece of advice that I would advise and leave folks with would be to question and really think deeply around the concepts that you are currently holding on to that might not actually serve you as well as they should. When you look at the role of AI and technology and social channels and all of these different things, it's very possible that you are holding on to some old principles, some old ideas, some old misconstrued beliefs that actually need to be challenged deeply to say, is this the best way of doing things? And I don't think marketers take enough time to actually reflect Maybe you need to do some yoga. Maybe you need to meditate, but you need to chill for just a second and just think, are we actually doing the things that are going to give us the greatest return? And if the answer is no, okay, reallocate your energy and your time to something that might be worthwhile. It's okay to start something new. Don't make the mistake of just doing the same old thing because it's the way it has always worked. Don't be afraid to shake it up and try something new. And that would be the last monologue that I will give. Awesome. Well, Ross, it has been great having you. Thank you, everyone, for listening 
to our latest episode of the Madvertising Podcast. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you are watching on YouTube. And um, we look forward to seeing you all next week. One second, one second. Wait, 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 Ross. Yep, yep, go ahead, go we, ahead. Where, where, can, where, where can we find you on the internet, Ross? Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to do a quick plug. I'm on all of your favorite social media channels at The Coolest Cool. That is my Twitter handle created in university when I fell in love with Lupe Fiasco. Um, definitely hit that follow button. Um, but I also have a podcast called Create Like the Greats. If you haven't checked it out, be sure to give it a listen, um, distributing and sharing some of the best stories around creators of all time. So I would love for folks to check that out as well. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so all much. Right. Well, thank you oh. for... Thank you for joining us. Thank you for yeah. having me. It's been a blast. Thanks, folks.